everyone and welcome to Cobblestones Chronicles once again. It's my pleasure to be here with you. I'm Jeanette wallace from Cobblestones Museum and I'm going to tell you a few stories from Cobblestones and about the early settlers in the Wairarapa and in the wider region. And it's just, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely and warm in the studio and it's a really cold winter's day out there. Um, according to our thermometer thingy at home, uh, it's actually five degrees at the moment, but feels like minus one. And I tell you what, the wind was coming right off the mountain into Great Town today. So it's nice to be in the studio. And... Today I've got um, a number of stories to tell you, um, one about the Bidwells because I thought that would be quite interesting. I found this book in the library, well actually I got some help from a lovely librarian and um, I thought well this, that would be quite interesting and then I'll play you some music as always and we'll have a lovely next hour together so thank you for being with me. Okay, so let's start off with some nice music. I thought that you might enjoy um, The Banks and Braes of Bonnie Doon, which of course is a good Scottish song. And um, so many of our settlers were from Scotland and they, um, they came here to, uh, to, for a new life. As, as I did, but um, I was only intending to spend three years here. That was 1983, so it's a bit later than that. But um, I loved it so much when I came here. And I think most Scots d do love it here because it's very similar to Scotland in many ways. And the Wara Rapper in particular reminds me very much of my home in South Ayrshire, which is another dairy area. So let's listen to Ye Banks and Braes o' Bonnie Doon because the Doon River is in South Ayrshire. Here you go. Ye banks and braes of bonny doom, how can ye bloom so fresh and fair? We 
with lights in my heart. I picked a rose full sweet upon its thorny tree, and my false lover stole my rose, but I he left the thorn with me. Lovely. That was sung by Lynn Wilkinson and the guitar playing was Michael, um, was her partner Mike, Mike, Michael. It was just a lovely song and of course words by Robert Burns. The tune is actually, um, Burns, Robert Burns didn't write music but he borrowed old tunes so it's an old tune from somewhere in Scotland, but there you go. Um, I went and popped into the library in Greytown and um, I was talking to the librarian. I was telling her what I was doing about being here and um, doing a radio programme about the early settlers in the region. And she said, ah, oh, I've got a couple of books you might enjoy. And the first one is this one called To Open Up the Country. And it's about, um, it's written by Frank Fife and Bernard Thornton. And it's um, published by the Greytown Folklore Society. And it's called Tales of Old Greytown and uh, you can borrow this out of Greytown Library or actually any of the other libraries you just have to go and, and request it and they'll send it to you wait a week or so until I've returned it though and um, it starts off with a, a, a quote um, by a roadman supposedly calling to Kempton's party at Paku Ratahi on the 22nd of March 1854. Go on my brave pioneers and let not prevent thy onward progress. You are the sort of men to open up the country. And of course Kempton was one of the first people who opened up um, the story of the arrival of the first party of Great Town Settlers, it's a look at that event through the eyes of the youngest member of that little group. He was Thomas Kempton Jr. As a lad in his early teens, he played a leading part in the first planned settlement of an inland town in New Zealand. And um, I think this... Um, this is this little book was published in 1981 and Frank Fife and Bernard Thornton said in telling our tale we have closely followed the published recollections of both Kempton's senior and junior and in no significant areas do we depart from known historical fact but of course it is a story and um, it's it's lovely because it starts off the light rain made little noise on the tent. Now and then large drops fell from the trees overhead as they stood in the breeze. Moorpox called. And I'm sure you've all heard Moorpox going, Moorpox, Moorpox. And I think the settlers who obviously, you know, come out from England, um, it would have been a very strange sound because it doesn't sound quite the same way as barn owls in England sound. 
So this was young Tom Kempton's fourth night in the tent, beside which his new house was to be built. He was tired, but as he went back over the events of the past week, his excitement grew and he could not sleep. After all, it wasn't every day that a boy was part of such an adventure. He was helping at the start of a new town. He had actually turned the very first sod himself. It was just over a week ago that he was well up well before dawn to help his father load the bullocks. The animals were to carry everything they were taking with them. And of course, they took everything to set up their new town. Pots and pans, flour, tea, sugar, the bedding, guns and ammunition, fruit trees, cabbage plants and flower seeds, axes and saws and nails to help them build the new town home. They were going up country to settle in the wild bush where no one had lived before. Tom's father, Tom Kempton Sr., was a member of the Small Farms Association and was to be amongst the earliest to take up land in the association's first township at Greytown. The boy had really looked forward to arriving at Greytown, but all there was when they arrived was a rough track through the thick native forest. So can you imagine coming up over the hill from Wellington and I guess you probably would have been able to look out um, from possibly from the trick station across this beautiful wide valley of the Wairarapa and it would have been covered, absolutely covered in bush, trees, manuka. Um, it would have just been, it was a forest. There were six in that first party of settlers and Tom remembered that he'd never seen any of the others before they set off. He recalled his surprise when a lady and a clergyman were included in the group of people which had joined his father. It was hard work for a boy, coaxing and urging his bullocks, and for the first part of the journey Tom was too busy to pay much of attention to his companions. Later in the day, however, he had found it easier and been able to look at them. Mr and Mrs Moles were warm-hearted and friendly people. Mrs Moles had made it her business to walk and chat with young Tom, and as they approached Taita in the late afternoon, she was at pains to point out things of lightly interest to her boy. Mr Moles wanted to be a shopkeeper and they had thought that going to Greytown was perhaps the only chance for people without a lot of money to be able to buy land and establish themselves in the new country. The Reverend Mr Brow was a friend of the Moles from Australia. He was not going to Greytown to settle but merely to accompany his friends. Tom thought he was kindly and mild-mannered. But young Tom's favourite travelling companion was the lively Mr Stevens. They had walked together for most of the second day, which was Tuesday, over the Mangaroas. He had talked such a lot about trees and plants and growing things and had even shown Tom some acorns he had brought from England. These, he said, he would plant in Great Anne. When later they had come to thick bush, Stevens was constantly darting off to examine trees and plants. Still later, he had become quite excited about finding some clay, which he thought was suitable for brick making. Good timber and good earth, he has said. These are the things to build a town of. They will last. So that's the first part of To Open Up the Country. Um, which is a lovely little book and uh, I'm very excited to have found it. And actually, um, I was thinking when I was planning today's programme that it's lovely when young people you know, are so excited and they um, so look forward. You know, there's not so much trepidation. And it reminded me of a song um, on an album by a lady I know, Jo Sheffield. Um, her album is called Gypsy Mind. And um, this is a, a lovely song. It says, build the memory strong is what it's, 
it's called, and it's about um, it's it's about how when you're younger, you want to go ahead and do things. You've got loads of courage, um, and this song I think is very appropriate. So here we go. Build the memories strong. Where does our courage go? Youth is so brave, can't say no Ski off a mountain into the air Trusting a parachute to take us where we want to go When does our courage fade? Seconds keep ticking and wisdom is made Still rush down the slopes with the wind in our hair Or take a chairlift just cause it's there We were never afraid Youth is not wasted on the young Helps us to find a place to belong To build our memories strong To live a lifetime long Let's build our memories strong Courage grows into confidence We learn resilience Youth is the compass to follow a dream Climb our own Learn what it means to swim against the stream. Build our memories strong To live a lifetime long Let's build those memories strong Build the Memories Strong by Joe Sheffield and uh, a lovely song so to continue the story um, to open up the country so over the hill inside the tent the regular breather told young tom his father was asleep and he turned over on his bed of ferns outside the rain was still falling and the bush noises seemed to be louder he let his mind go back that to the night they had spent at the golden fleece hotel how the roadmen had laughed and danced and sung. They had been paid for their work on the roads and were celebrating. And 
The roadmen, of course, lived in roadmen's huts, which would be moved along as the, the roadmen did their work. And if you come to cobblestones, in the far corner over beside the school, you can see a roadman's hut on its wheels and have a, a little peek inside and have an idea. It's like a, a very, very small caravan. And um, it's... a just a peek into what it took to open up this country, to have the roadmen working all the time on the roads because that's what it took, and keeping them keeping them in good order. And in fact, this story goes on to talk about the next part of the road. Um, the road was wide and well formed, and even the bullocks had seemed to be eager to be off from the Golden Fleece Hotel. But before they had gone very far, both people and animals were feeling the strain of the steep climb, because of course this is where they started to come up to up the Rumatakas. It had taken most of that day to reach the top, and there the constructed road had stopped. From then on, it was only a rough bridle track, very narrow and very steep. In places, the bush met overhead, and branches and fallen trees almost blocked the way. That afternoon, when they were all tired, the bullocks had plunged down the steep track, dashing the loaded pockets against tree trunks and sweeping some of them from their backs. Some had burst, and there was a terrible mess of split flour and seeds and broken, broken crockery had littered the track. The poor weary settlers salvaged what they could and re-roaded the unsettled beasts. They were all quite glad when at last they came to an empty roadman's foray in which they could spend the night. They were up very early on Thursday morning, eager to escape the fleas which had bothered them during the night. Tom recalled that they hadn't been going long when they first glimpsed the valley to which they were descending descending. His father had called three cheers for the Wairarapa and their cheers had echoed and re-echoed from the surrounding hills. For quite a long time they had stood looking out over the valley, each no doubt picturing what the scene would be like when it included a small town with smoke rising from chimneys and a little church with its steeple. Images and memories were tumbling through young Tom Kempton's head as he lay in the tent, unable to sleep. He should have had no trouble at all, for that day had been a full one. But somehow that thought just made matters worse, and he tried hard to recall his feelings as at last the party had trodden on the valley floor. He recalled how surprised he had been to find Burling's accommodation house tucked into the very last fold of the Rimataka Hills. The 15 kilometres from there to Greytown had been among the very worst the party had encountered. The first part of the journey was over a stony plain, then through flax and scrub, there was no path, and swamp, that swamp! They had each not thought they would not be able to flounder their way through it. The bull bullocks had to be constantly prodded and shouted at, and many times they had become stuck in the mud. And everyone who knows what a bullock looks like know that they can be very stubborn. After the swamp had come about five metres of big boulders, and then the crossing of the Teheranika River, Luckily, that presented very little problem as the water was low, but before long they had crossed the Moroa Plain and were into the dense bush that was their goal. Here they found that a survey line had been cut right through the centre and the surveyors were still at work pegging out the acre town sections. Because remember, each of the settlers had purchased one acre in town and 40 acres in the surrounding area. 
Tom remembered the meeting with his surveyor Corbett that Thursday afternoon and of how someone with a knife history had noted the hour of the day as being 4pm. Mr Corbett had been quite surprised when the party had arrived because it had only just a week before the land had been made available for selection and he hardly expected anyone to have arrived so soon. Corbett was able to point out their sections but everyone had decided to camp upon the Kempton's town acre and so it was there that they had erected their tents and passed the first night in company. The very next morning they had started to explore the surroundings, the bush and the river, paying close attention to the soil. Water had seemed the biggest problem as the nearest stream was a kilometre away towards the Pa at Papawai. They had found evidence of wild pigs and there were lots of wood pigeons which they were able to turn into hearty meals. Yes, well, having looked at wood pigeons, they're nice and plump, aren't they? And I, know, I understand they're very easy to catch. Luckily, we don't do that anymore. The survey had been delayed, and although the town acres were nearly completed, the 40-acre suburban sections were not available. All about them in the bush were surveyors' pegs marking off the road reserves and the numbered town sections. They all felt very much a part of the beginnings of a new township. So, that's a beginning of a new township. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play you another song. Um, this one is from a CD called Row Out to Your Ship of Dreams by a chap called um, Nigel Perry. And um, it was written by Nigel. And this is... Um, he calls it, um, this is a land shanty and a journey and it's called The Road is Long and I thought it went very well with that particular part of the story. So here we go, The Road is Long, written by Nigel Perry, a land shanty. At first the journey's just begun and the road is long At first the journey's just begun There's all the road still to be run And the road is long And the way is winding and then you journey on your own And the road is long And then you journey on your own It's time to play a solo tune And the road is long And the way is winding and then you find there's room for two And the road is long And then you find there's room for two Someone chose to be with you And the road is long And the way is winding Next comes a band to fill the stage And the road is long Next comes a band to fill the stage It's time to write another page And the road is long And the way is wide Your group is where you put your soul And the road is long Your group is where you put your soul There's never enough to fill the bowl And the road is long 
and the way is winding. Then maybe again a one-man show, and the road is long. Then maybe again a one-man show, the open road has miles to go. And, and the road is long, and the way is winding. A chance meet as you're on your way, and the road is long. A chance meet as you're on your way, brings new life to your tired old play and the road is long and the way is winding and then your journey's nearly done and the road is long and then your journey's nearly done the road behind rolls far and long and, and the road is long and the way is winding at last your journey's at the end and the road is long at last your journey's at the end There's no more time to make Or to spend And the road is long And the way is winding Nigel Perry's song The Road is Long and the Way is Winding Lovely song and um, that bass harmony was um, delivered by my own dear husband, Mr. Niels Gage, uh, along with Sue Rose and uh, Philippa Gander. So a lovely, lovely song. Um, when I come into Arrow FM at each Thursday, on the reception counter is an encouragement to learn a new word in Maori every time. So this morning I picked up one purely by chance and the English word is cold and it's very appropriate today because it's absolutely freezing out there outside. So if you're at home staying in the warm that's very wise. And the Maori word for cold is makariri and I think that's really appropriate, Makariri, because of course the first settlers would have been in tents and they were um, huddled together because um, they wanted to obviously be together for, for a while before they claimed and started building. And you can imagine how Makariri it must have been because it would have been in, in the bush, um, it would have been damp, and cold um, and they had only ferns probably to lie on beds of ferns so I really admire them they were so determined and so tough really incredible so to continue with um, Thomas Kempton's story on Sunday morning they had all gathered on the Kempton Acre where they were joined by Mr Corbett and his men, Mr Corbett the Surveyor, as Mr Brough had con conducted the first church service in Greytown. There in the open air, surrounded by huge tortura trees, they had given thanks. Tom recalled how Mr Brough had spoken of the promised promised land and he had thought that that was a very good thing to talk about. Young Tom felt a warm glow of satisfaction 
uh, having been a part of establishing the first inland town in New Zealand. Yes, as the roadman has said, when they sent them off, they really had opened up the country. And in fact, um, at the back of this book is a song. I'm not going to sing it because um, it was it was really interesting to see that they had put together a song. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I might try and get my my dear husband to sing it and do a recording one day, which would be quite interesting. They really were uh, an amazing bunch. And they, um, I always think that the woman who came along with the settlers, um, they had left everything and they had probably been um, enticed away with lots of you know, promises and they knew that life was going to be very hard because they wouldn't have their families around them. Because um, traditionally in the Victorian times, um, families would stay quite close together. And for a time in the um, 2000s, um, Niels and I lived in a small village in Wiltshire in England. And we were always amazed at how the families had been there for centuries. I mean, they were just the same families. They'd always been there, and that was where it was. And in some ways that rings a bell for me because um, uh, I know where my family came from in the south of Scotland, in the south uh, of Dumfrieshire and in near the Rins of Galloway and the family farm is still there and there are still distant relatives on the family farm. Um, my grandfather had moved into the city um, along to stay with his uh, eldest sister who had uh, a dairy in the city and the milk was um, supplied from the farm. So it's interesting to see how um, my ancestors uh, hadn't actually moved that far, mostly, although my grandmother's eldest sister, uh, by the time my grandmother was born, because there was more than 20 years between them, the eldest sister had moved to America. She'd immigrated to America. So they knew that they probably wouldn't ever see them again. And in fact, in the family portrait, there is a little cutout and she had sent an appropriate sized photograph which had been pasted into the family portrait. It's amazing. So I'm going to play another song now. And this is another, um, it's another song by Robert Burns. It's called Lizzie Lindsay. And it's about a man saying to a young woman, come on, come away with me, come, come away with me. Um, you won't regret it, honestly. So, oops, here we go. So here we have Lizzie Lindsay, uh, sung by Michael McKinnon and uh, Lynn Wilkinson again. It's a, a particularly lovely song. Oh, the lights in the city are like diamonds The street lamps, the signs and the cars Though it's bright in the city, what are diamonds When they're turning out all of our stars what you can to the Elands, Lizzy Lindsay. What you can to the Elands with me. What you can to the Elands, Lizzy Lindsay. My pride and my darling to be. It's so loud. 
in this town, Lizzie Lindsay. The worry and the working and the noise, and we can't hear the birds when they're singing. And the river is losing its voice. Where'd you go to the healing sleazy Lindsay? Where'd you go to the healings with me? Where'd you go to the healings, Lizzy Lindsay? My pride and my darling to be. When I am with you, Lizzy Lindsay, I don't have to worry about being alone. We can live anywhere that we choose to. When I'm with you, I know that I'm at home. Where'd you come to the healings, Lizzy Lindsay? Where'd you come to the healings with me? Where'd you come to the healings, Lizzy Lindsay? My pride and my darling to be. My pride and my darling to be. My pride and my darling. Lizzie Lindsay, my pride and my darling to be. I I think um, it's uh, the um, young man who was enticing Lizzie Lindsay uh, was a very um, must have been quite a charming young man. So I think um, it's a particularly lovely song. And I really enjoy it. As I said before, um, the thing about uh, Robert Burns, uh, he spent uh, his most of his life in Ayrshire and uh, Dumfrieshire in the southwest of Scotland. It's very much my part of the country, Scotland. Um, it is very much like the Wairu Rapa and... Um, quite a tough life because there was absolutely no chance of actually owning um there was no chance of owning land you were always a tenant farmer at best because the land was owned by the laird or the lords or you know they always would lease out the land and you could um lease it uh, often for quite long periods but it was always a little bit precarious. And I think that's why so many people came to live in New Zealand, because there was the opportunity to own land and to to buy land. And that was where the Small Farms Association and other such ventures were, were very, very attractive. And I, I think that... Um, it, it took, it was a big step to do it, but goodness me, um, just so exciting. Absolutely lovely. Um, I, I thought, um, so I'm almost at the end of today's programme, and I thought I might finish by playing um, a song, My Father's People, uh, it's written by Nils Gedge and um, I've played this song before because I think it's particularly appropriate because a lot of it is about the settlers because my husband's family came out here, um, various bits of them. Some of them were from uh, Somerset and they um, set sail and they went to uh, from Plymouth and went to 
New Plymouth. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's a, an amazing thought that they sailed from Plymouth in England to New Plymouth in New Zealand. And of course, there's a, a Plymouth in in um, there's a Plymouth in America as well, where the settlers had sailed from Plymouth in Devon to New to Plymouth in um, on the east coast of America. So I'll play you this little song. Um, well, it's my father's people, which is talking about. Um, some of his ancestors and how they came here. Um, a lot of they actually ended up in the Waikato, uh, although they had started off um, in northern Wairarapa, just below Danivark at one point, um, because some of Niels's family were Scandinavians. He had a Danish grandmother, great grandmother, and a Swedish great grandfather. And an interesting thing about his great grandfather, who'd come out from, uh, left from Sweden, they'd been in Gotland, and he and his brother came to get land, of course, because the eldest brother got the farm and the other boys had to go and see if they could find something else, another way of life. And their mother had given them a Bible as they left. And when they got to New York, they bought an English Bible and they taught themselves to speak English by comparing the Swedish Bible and the English Bible. And I just think that's so enterprising They so that they spent the journey, uh, to the rest of the journey to New Zealand because they were sailing here on a ship and of course it takes a while. But... Um, that was a very enterprising thing to do. So here we have my father's people. <laughs> Sorry, wrong song. I am. Um, this is my father's people. My father's people cleared a forest, drained all the swamps, broke in the farms by the old Tapo Road. We bailed in summer, fed out in winter, and fed the car. Sundays down at the hall Mrs. Mac played the sweet by and by And old Pop Finley was still waiting on the lawn To lift him up to his home To his home in the sky Time came Moved to the city, packed a big truck, drove over the hill. But deep down inside, we were sons of the forest. Guess in my heart, I'm living there still. Mrs. Mac, hair in a bun. Upright as her old piano I hear her daughter Is living in Sydney Last week her grandson emailed From Rio Barefoot days, the shadows now That walk so short In the high noon garden 
but later today, I swear they did lengthen as the sun was setting west of Eden. There's a place I go. You can map it on Google. Place I go, you can't get there by car. Place I go, might find my brother. And the place I go, it's a place in my heart. Someday down at the hall. Mrs. Mac played the sweet by and by And old Pop Finley was to wait on the lawn To lift him up to his home To his home in the sky To lift him up to his home To his home in the sky My Father's People by Niels Gedge and um, the backing vocals are from Marion Carter and Amanda O'Connor and the pump organ that you heard in the background was um, played by Helen Dorothy and in fact that pump organ is at Paikakariki Station. So that's it from me for today's programme. I hope you've enjoyed listening as much as I enjoy producing and talking about this programme. It's lots of fun researching and again thank you to Greytown Librarian for helping me and I'll speak to you soon. Have a great day and stay warm.